So our next speaker is Liam Orin. He is a freelance producer, a writer, a director. We're, he's recently worked on A&E, CTV, TSN, Discovery Canada, History Television, and most recently he's been working with CBC's Doc Zone and The Nature of Things. In 2010, he wrote and directed the first ever Canadian produced 3D documentary, and it was called Queen Elizabeth in 3D. He has completed Forgotten No More, uh, The Lost Men of the 78s for CBC's Doc Zone. He's uh, been honored uh, by being a member of the Writers Guild of Canada. And today he's going to be sharing his knowledge on how do you create impactful films. And I know for many of you here in the audience who have been involved with our 15K Challenge, you all know that a film, not really a film, I guess maybe a video or something kind of short, is something that we expect as one of the products. So I know this is something that's going to be a great deal of interest to all of us. So please join me in welcoming Liam to the stage. I'm still uh, thinking about that fly. <laughs> Can't get it out of my head. Um, as all of you probably know, uh, production is broken into three stages. You've got pre-production. That will be your research, your gathering materials, your writing a, a script outline or shooting script, as we call it, and all the prep work. Uh, the second stage is production, where you're shooting. Third stage is post-production, editing, putting it all together. Today, I'm going to focus really on pre-production because the days of kind of making it up as you go along are long gone, unless you're living off, living off pizza and living in your parents' basement. For the rest of us that need to make a living, you have to actually be prepared when you're out on location. So this time at the end, I will do a little bit on editing. Um, I don't want to sound like Donald Rumsfeld, but to me as a group, you're a bit of an unknown unknown. I know a little bit about you, but I don't know what you don't know. So yeah, he, he's the only one who could mangle the language like that. But um, what I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm going to apologize up front, could be pretty basic, very, very basic. So um, don't be insulted. And you kind of think, well, if it's not basic, why do you need to tell us at all? We can just do it ourselves. Well, trust me. In this business, you can never be too explicit. Never assume. They may look like adults. They may speak like adults. But well, once you show up at a camera, boy, things are different. Now, let's say um, I'm going to interview Jacqueline here. So I call up Jacqueline and say, I'm going to be at your house tomorrow. No, you can say we are. Jacqueline, I'm not going to actually do anything. I'm going to come to your house tomorrow at 9 o'clock, and we're going to interview you. Here's the question. Should I tell Jacqueline what to wear? What do you think? If you think I should, put up your hand. That's pretty good. Half of you probably think I should. I would never tell anyone what to wear. I might suggest it. Because when I show up at Jacqueline's house, it could be that she's actually a fan of Megadeth. And she arrives in her cut-off shorts and this t nice T-shirt with a skeleton dancing with a naked lady. And I'm thinking, apart from scaring the kiddies, maybe there's going to be copyright issues with this. Uh, not a big deal, because I've gone to Jacqueline's home and I say, Jacqueline, I think you should change the uh, shirt. No big deal. But if I was going to her office, it could be a big deal. And if we were out in the sticks somewhere where there's no chance of changing, it's a huge deal. Now, you think, Jacqueline, she seems like a well-adjusted person, would not do that. But I have met Jacqueline's <laughs> in my time at a university in this province, which shall remain nameless. And I'm on a scout. So I've met this young woman who's got more degrees than I'll ever see in my life, operating equipment that's massively expensive. And I say, we're going to be back next week. We're going to do a little piece with you. You look great. We want a few shots of you working this machine. And she thinks, cool, I'm going to be on TV. Great. So I show up the next week, and she is wearing a sweatshirt with a movie poster on it. 
because their boss had some really tenuous connection with this movie and thought, this is gonna be real cool and everyone's gonna really get it. And I think, no, they're not. <laughs> so I have to say, I'm not gonna mention names, but could you put on the white lab coat? And luckily it was there, we are fine. That's the sort of thing you gotta deal with. It's details, details, details. So the other thing I'm gonna do is probably try and tell you this story in chronologically, but I am gonna jump around a bit too. I just did with the story about the top. This is really important for anybody who's a shooter, camera person. I was saving this to the end so you'd remember it, but then I was afraid if we run out of time, I won't be able to tell you. So I'm gonna tell you right now. Let's say, here I am. We're doing the interview with Jacqueline. <coughs> camera, set up. And I'm talking about basic, cheapo, handy cam. Ready to go. Everybody ready? We all ready? Good, good to go? Okay, hang on a sec. We're recording, good. Oh, shit, no. Jacqueline, your, your hair is just, I'm just gonna fix it. Okay, good, okay. Good to go, good to go. Okay, let's it record. What was the mistake? Anybody see the mistake? What was the mistake? Mm -mm. We can cut that out. Let's do this again, because this is really important, and people do this, okay? So everybody ready? Yeah, we're all good. Everyone good, 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 okay, let's go, okay, hit record, we're ready to go. Okay, oh, say, you got something just to go, fix it, okay, here we're, hold on a second, hit record, and let's go. Oh my God, I just turned off the camera. Now, Vince back there would never do that, but you wouldn't believe that people that have done that, <laughs> Here's the problem, at the end of the interview, and maybe Jacqueline's spoken for an hour, I come back and turn the camera on. And now I'm recording all the chit chat that goes on between where we're setting up for the next shot. And if I power down the camera, because we're going for lunch, I will never even know that I did it. Now luckily, if I spot that mistake, we'll be fine. But if I don't, we've lost it. Here's the second thing. It is vital, vital when you're shooting. Check playback before you leave that location. Because if you don't find out until you get to the edit, you're screwed. Okay, I wanna to get to know a little bit about you. Is there anybody here who has completed their video and posted it online? Great, one, two, only two, okay. Um, has anybody here looked at the videos that are online? Is that it? That is incredible. There's about 20 of these videos online. I highly recommend you should look at them. This is not a competition, but it's an opportunity to see what your colleagues are doing, and they've got presumably the same budget as you, which I think roughly rounds down to nothing. Um, I've watched them all, and all 20, without fast-forwarding, without skipping, and I have to say, I was quite impressed. There's a good range there from here to here. Some of them are really good, some are pretty good. There's no duds. I learned a lot. So you really should watch them. It's, you learn more from watching them than anything I could tell you in 20 minutes there. So, there was one thing that struck me, and this is a, an observation, not a criticism, although that's what my wife says all the time. And <laughs> I explained to her that if you're looking at something, it's an observation. If you're talking about it, it is a criticism. <laughs> so this is a criticism. Let's call this if you're speaking directly to camera, it's a non-camera or a stand-up, bit of a misnomer, because you could be sitting do down doing a stand-up, or as the Brits call it, a PDC, a piece of the camera. They were too long. Just, there's so much you can take. They're too long. And you need to cover them with pictures. That's the one criticism. It was consistent. 
Now, I was going to show you some examples of this, and I said, well, I could get a few of my mates together, we could shoot something, but that'd be kind of a bit like cheating because it'd be professional, it'd be right gear. So I said, I'm just going to do something with my own mediocre gear, put a little thing together to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So, uh, you guys ready to? So, here's one. Oh, wait, just wait, hold it a sec, hold it a sec. Just want to give you a bit of background. Um, for this, I created my own little community event, kind of community group where we are looking after newly arrived people to Toronto. Our focus for this project is how to deal with traffic because it's kind of unique. So this is what you're going to see is one minute from my five minute video and that'll give you an idea of what we're talking about here. On average, every year 60 people are killed in road accidents in the GTA. That's just over one a week. NATO's plan is to reduce those numbers by introducing a community education program starting with the crosswalk. While the procedure may be obvious to anyone who grew up in Toronto, to the newcomer it can be a little daunting. The only way to learn is through observing and experimenting. And that raises some interesting questions. Does the traffic automatically stop when you step on the road? Sometimes it looks that way. Or should you wait on the sidewalk until the traffic has stopped completely before crossing? Our short video will answer those questions and make this seemingly simple procedure crystal clear. Okay, I'll admit it, and I think you'll agree, that was pretty bad. Pathetic is the word that comes to mind, maybe even painful. And it was way too long, 57 seconds. The shot was weak, the delivery was flat, absolutely no energy, and it was crying out for some B-roll. Okay, let's take another look. Same information, here's take two. On average, every year, 60 people are killed in road accidents in the GTA. That's just over one a week. NATO's plan is to reduce those numbers by introducing a community education program, starting with the crosswalk. While the procedure may be obvious to anyone who grew up in Toronto, to the newcomer, it can be a little daunting. The only way to learn is by observing and experimenting, and that raises some interesting questions. Does the traffic automatically stop when you step on the road? Sometimes it looks that way. Or should you wait on the sidewalk until the traffic stops completely before crossing? Our short video will answer those questions and make this seemingly simple procedure crystal clear. You get the idea? Pictures tell the story. Um, the other thing about that is when you know that you're going to cover the middle bit, you don't have to learn off um, 60 minutes of, or 60 seconds of dialogue, so it makes it a lot easier. Uh, the one concession on that uh, was I did actually borrow uh, a mic from a sound recorder, so it was a real um, professional um, wireless mic. The problem with uh, handycams is they tend to have a camera mic and they're, they're pretty much useless. I actually bought a mic for for three bucks, if you can believe it, that, but what was connected to the camera and was marginally better, but that's one area where uh, it does help to have a decent mic. Okay, so um, I'm gonna move on to the next bit. Um, as Billy Wilder said, um, I get absolutely no reaction from that. Does anyone know who Billy Wilder is? <laughs> oh good, oh my God, there's at least two people who know Billy Wilder. That's good. Bill, I'm going to have to start finding new people to quote from, but check him out on IMDb. Any movie Billy, My Billy Wilder made was brilliant. Um, Billy Wilder said, democracy is a great way to run a country, but it's no way to make a movie. Now, I'm sure, given what you do, you're a very collegial bunch, but you really should designate people to do specific jobs. So I just want to get a sense of here, how many people are working in a team of two? Just two people. Uh, three? Four? How many are one? Is there one people that are working with themselves? Put up your... Okay, that's tough. Um, you really... 
Well, if you're working on one, it's, it is very tough. It's going to take a long time. I mean, even trying to put this thing together, have my wife help me, and it's, it's tough. Um, you really should break it down and designate different roles. You want to be a writer? Somebody's got to write this thing. Because you're going to write a shooting script. What you hope, what you want, what you think this will be. It's very daunting. You've just spent six months researching this project. You may have spent another six months working it. And you end up with this huge, massive thing that you're being asked to compress down to five minutes. And everything is very important. Every detail is important. How can I cut this? How can I lose that? Um, I think that's the wrong approach. I think you start off a very, very small thing and build it up to five minutes. So how do you, how do, you do that uh, quickly? Well, here's a quick way I do. Imagine you're having a conversation with the 10-year-old boy who lives next door. You're coming home one day from work, and he says to you, by the way, what do you do? He says that to me, I'd say, well, I work for a company called NATO, and we help newly arrived people in Toronto. That's pretty good. So what are you working on right now? I said, well, we're helping people adjust to traffic in Toronto. That is your script. Everything else is details. Everything else is just layers on top of that. Don't get hung up on huge, big things. Keep it simple. The job of the writer is to also include visuals. What pictures? You've got to think through that. OK. You've got to think through what sort of pictures you're going to use. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of start cutting to the chase here, moving on. Director. What does a director do? The director will take those, that script. Sometimes the writer and director are the same person. In my case, that's what it is. We'll take that script, visualize it, figure out how it's going to look, what you're going to do with it, how it's going to come together. How many people here have appeared on camera? Oh, uh, quite a bit. OK, keep it. Anyone who's appeared on camera and was happy with their appearance, <laughs> keep their hand up. You were good, too, too good. Okay. Two people were. They're so vain, these people. <laughs> um, a good director will actually enhance your performance by coaching you, helping you, encouraging you, telling you what to do, or saying, maybe we should narrate this. Maybe you shouldn't be on camera. But that's what another job that a good director will do. Designate somebody to be your shooter. Obviously, you want somebody that's got a good eye. Maybe they're a bit of a photographer, or maybe it's the guy from accounts who has a decent camera. But somebody's got to be the camera person. And lastly, anybody know what a uh, producer does? Me, me neither. I, I have no clue. They show up, get a big check. I don't know what they do. <laughs> actually, a producer will put all the logistics together. They're great to have. They actually organize the thing. So if you have four people, designate four different roles. If you haven't, you've got to double up. If you're on your own, good luck. So you've got your team together, you've written your script, are you ready to go and shoot? Not quite. It's essential that you do a scout. Now you may be thinking, well, we're gonna shoot this in the boredom, so we don't need to do a scout. If you're gonna shoot in the boredom, you're gonna have a pretty lame video, right? At some point, you're gonna go outside and shoot. And even if you're shooting in the boredom, consider it to be a location and consider it as something you should scout. The idea of a scout is to gather information, every single possible question that you want to know. And while you're doing the scout, you're also gathering information for a call sheet. Because for every day you go out shooting, you want to have a call sheet. Now, there is uh, some sample call sheets there. There's plenty online. They will list every single detail of what you're going to do on your shoot day. Starting with crew call. There's very few rules in this business, but the one rule is nobody is late for crew call. So let's say we're going to be at uh, Jacqueline's house at 9 o'clock. I would suggest that maybe you meet at 8 o'clock. And, you know, meet at a cafe. So what's the point of meeting at a cafe? You know, everybody has eaten breakfast because that avoids that thing at 11 o'clock where the sound guy turns around and you say, I'm starving. When are we going to get a break? Did you not have breakfast? I don't do breakfast. Well, that's tough. <laughs> so if you meet at 8 o'clock, you can all have breakfast. The crew, the, crew, um, the crew call sheet will list every single detail, as I said. 
is another, speaking of food, another crucial detail, probably the most important thing on the uh, call sheet, lunch. <laughs> I am an adult. A Mars bar and an apple doesn't cut it. I want to sit down for an hour, eat a hot meal, and so does everybody else. If you skip that by 3 o'clock, people get very, very nasty. So you got your crew call. You've got all of these things. By the way, a quick tip, as it just occurs to me. For writing script, not a big deal. Five minutes is your goal for these videos. One page, and I've got a sample at the back, one page in Arial font, point size 11, translates consistently as two minutes of screen time. OK? And the other way to measure things is by people speak three words a second. So if your piece of script is 180 words, that will be a minute. So they're just quick ways of doing that. OK, so uh, you are ready to shoot. And you know, we're going to roll the second video. I've just put together a couple of very, very basic tips for shooting. So they're just strung together with no logic to them, but let's play it. Here's something to remember. Never use a swivel chair. Why? Because people will start doing this. And that's annoying. Like everything else, keep it simple. That's better. But I think we're way too close to this wall. You need to try and get a bit of separation from the background. Kind of move it forward. That just feels better. There is a bit of separation between me and the background. The close-up. Broadcasters love the close-up, especially those investigative journalism types. They're hoping that the bad guy is going to break into a sweat and reveal all, or that a distraught mother is going to break down in tears. For the rest of us, though, I don't think we're quite ready for a close-up. The wide shot, head to toe. It's my personal favorite because body language speaks volumes. The medium shot, classic. And while some classics are cool, I have to say, I'm not a fan. But as a lot of you use this frame, I'm going to use it to point out some issues. Firstly, looking off camera or looking down at your notes makes you look shifty. You have to lock your eyes right into the lens. Too much headroom. Not enough headroom. Actually, it's cut off. Camera too high. Makes me look diminished. And I certainly don't want that. On average, every year... Ah, the two shot. Gotta say, I'm not a fan. Here's the problem. While she's talking, where do I look? Now this is good. This is not. This is good. This is not. You know, it's difficult enough when you've got something to say to lock into the lens, but when you're a bystander, it's really tough. So what may help is if the two of us had a little bit of interaction, that could work. Something like this. On average, every year, 60 people are killed in road accidents in the GTA. That's just over one week, and that includes drivers, cyclists and pedestrians. NATO plans to reduce those numbers. We're creating a community awareness program starting with the crosswalk. OK, you get the idea? If you really have to have two people in the shot, try and get some banter like this going and it could work. OK, time to take it outside. Welcome to the great outdoors. Now exterior scenes will add a huge amount of production value and you can shoot pretty much any b-roll regardless of conditions. But what we're talking about today is shooting people, stand-ups and interviews. The plus side of being outside is that you can choose from a wide variety of backgrounds. Now at this point I was going to show myself in a wide variety of backgrounds, but I think that might be overkill. I think you can imagine the possibilities. But there are downsides to shooting outside. Firstly, very little control over the light and very little control over background noise. You can hear that streetcar behind me. This is where a good sound man will help. 
failing that, the next best thing is to show the noise. If your viewer can see what's causing the noise, in this case the streetcar, they will be a lot more forgiving. As for light, this, in many ways, is the perfect day. It's overcast, what little sun there is is being diffused, so you don't get those hard, nasty shadows. Also, try to avoid days with those big, white, puffy clouds. Your exposure is going to be in and out, you're going to be in and out of shadows, and you don't want that. Uh, also, if you do get a beautiful, clear, sunny day, avoid shooting in the middle of the day, say between noon and 2 o'clock. Uh, the sun is directly overhead and it casts nasty shadows under the eyes. The best time of day to shoot, as any cameraman will tell you, is the hour after sunrise and the hour before sunset, what we like to call magic hour. Everything is soft and golden, everything looks amazing. But be warned, as soon as the sun starts going down, it goes down very quickly. Back to you, Liam. But when it comes to interviews or interview locations, be adventurous. I um, mean, I like to, you know, sometimes go out into stairwells, although they can be very echoey. Um, but just think beyond the office. All of those things were funny there, but, but they're all things that I saw in the videos. So I wasn't making it up. Um, one of the things that did really strike me as odd and this was consistent, and when you watch these videos, and you, I know you're gonna go home and watch them tonight. Actually, what I think you should do really is gather your team and watch them in, in groups of maybe two or three at a time and take notes or whatever. You're not gonna watch 20 at a go, trust me. They're good, but they're not that good. Um, but this is something I've never seen before, this new delivery to, to camera that people look directly at camera, but they're talking as if they're like on a Skype conversation or whether it's like from teleconference. I've never come across this, so it's odd. My expectation is that if you're on camera, you're clear, concise, sharp, and short. Whereas what I'm gonna suggest to you guys is if you've got a team and there's one person that's good on that, choose that person to be your direct on camera, reporter type. They've got energy and they can pull it off. And for the rest of you, consider going back to the old fashioned way of just doing an interview. Because an interview is a lot more forgiving. Does that make sense? I'm gonna give you an example. Have we got time to give you an example? Jacqueline, I want you to ask me, asking me a question. And I want you to ask me, um, What's the biggest challenge facing documentary filmmakers today? But, but just before you ask me the question, the difference, with, the difference between an on-camera and an interview is with the on-camera, it can be controlled and you can script it. Obviously, with an interview, you're, you're not going to script it. And I'll come back to that if I can in a minute. But. So what you're listening for as the interviewer is a clean in. You've got to find a clean in. So ask the question. Wow, gee, uh, let me think. Whew. Well, I, you know, I've been in this business for, I guess, oh, probably 30 plus years, and um, it's, that's a tough one, you know. And I think, <laughs> um, but, I, you know, I have to say, the biggest challenge facing uh, documentary filmmakers today is that um, budget cuts. Because when I started in this business, it was normal to have a cameraman, a sound man, uh, possibly a reporter, producer, a director, and maybe even an assistant camera. So certainly, you know, four was the norm, and six was not that unusual. But now, thanks to the creation of the videographer, um, you know, it's a one-man band. And the videographer even edits it. So it's totally changed. That's an interview. And did you get the clean in? There was a clean in, right? The same thing if you're doing it as a stand-up would be, yeah, uh, the biggest challenge facing documentary filmmakers today is budget. Uh, but thanks to uh, the, the sorry, I'll go to, go to that again. Take two. The biggest challenge facing uh, documentary filmmakers today is budget. Gone are the glory days of three, four, or five man crew. Thanks to the creation of the videographer, it's now a one man band. So it's very simple, very different. But the uh, see, I like the rambling, kind of charming, anecdotal story. 
So, and I think anyone can do that. Here's one of the problems. Um, certainly if you go outside your group, you get into this. Um, if you're interviewing anybody else, you're interviewing, say, experts or whatever, the chances are they're going to say, yeah, sure, we'll do the interview. Can you send us over the questions? You never give people the questions in advance. Fine in your group, but outside your group, never do it. Because people try to learn off the questions. OK, three minutes to go. Um, so that's a danger. The other thing is you're dealing with two types of people. People that are media savvy, that have done this before, and they'll say, what are you looking for here? You're looking for like 15, 20 seconds. You want a bit longer. They know exactly what you want. It's great. And then you're dealing with the rest of the world. And what you want, especially if you're not appearing on camera, is that clean in. So you, this is a real risky thing. You're looking at these people and you say, hmm, am I going to set this up right? Do I just go for it and see what happens? Or do I say, you know something, Jacqueline? I'm going to interview you, but I'm not going to use my questions. So if you could incorporate my question into your answer, that would be great. So when I ask you what's the biggest challenge facing documentary filmmakers today, you're going to say, the biggest challenge is, great, God, that's so good. It doesn't always work out that way. I was on a shoot down in Topeka, Kansas, where they race pickup trucks. It's Kansas, what can I say? And I'm interviewing this guy, and I put that to him. I said, here's the thing, uh, Ted, or whatever your name is. I'm not going to use my questions, so would you incorporate my question into your answer? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah sure, I can do that. So, OK, Ted, um, tell me about qualifying. Well, a lot of people ask me that question about qualifying. And what I always say to them, and so it, it's a tough one. You can't win. Um, I'm going to wrap this up. Most importantly, put a huge amount of time into your prep, your scouting. You want everything on the day to go smoothly. You want no surprises. And if you do all that, you can absolutely have fun. Enjoy it. It's a great job. It's a great thing to do. Just enjoy it. All right, that's it. Well, thank you very much. I think we're not going to be able to look at our 15. You mentioned that a lot of the mics that come with handy cams are very cheap. Could you suggest uh, a couple of different kinds of mics that would be good that aren't too expensive? Um, I think you're, I know there's a great mic for if you're doing studio stuff, if you're doing narration, it's made by a company called Blue, and they've got a snowball, and it's, it's about a hundred bucks, but it's a very good mic for those places where you're doing narration. The downside of it is it's, it's, it's quite ugly. Um, like what I'm wearing now is like a lavalier mic, and you want something, if you're doing stand-ups, you want something like that. Um, you know something? I bet Vince and um, Devin at the back would be able to answer that better than you, because, hey, I'm a director. I don't have to deal with that stuff. <laughs> I've got people to look after that. I honestly don't know. Uh, it's pretty, pretty specific, but they might be able to help you. Other Anybody else? Um, well, for, for, for this, I went to Henry's uh, outlet um, place out in Mississauga, and for 200 bucks, I got a pretty decent Canon um, little Handycam for 200 bucks. Um, you want something that's now, you want something that's HD. So you'll get a used camera for 200 bucks. So it's affordable. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use, shoot anything on my phone. Uh, like, you know, you've got to... You're going to have some sort of investment. You've got to figure out, are you going to make other uses of this? Um, but that's the type of money you're looking at spending. I asked, I asked my, my sound friend about the mic. The mic that I had for this would cost about 1200 bucks. Yeah, so that's out. And I said, is there anything in between? She said, I'll get your question in a sec. Um, she said, you get a really good used mic for maybe 400 Question there. That's a good point. Yeah. You can rent. Um, and on renting, oh, here, here's a really important question. No matter what you're using, make sure you know what you're shooting and make, make sure you know how to use it. 
don't practice on the day. And trust me, even at the pro level, I've seen that happen. It's very simple. There's so many digital media startups, there's so many, the technology is pervasive in the community in general, uh, especially for a lot of the people here today, apparently, who are working in isolation or alone, or maybe so many people beyond four. You just need to go and ask a bunch of college university students who are majoring in media studies. That's a good point, yeah. And they just say, I've got a great thing for your resume. We've just have our research, we've finished our report, we've got, <clears throat> we've drafted a community outreach document, we're gonna hold a presentation, etc. We just want a three to five minute video or whatever. Would you like to do it? And we'll give you all the support and all the acknowledgements and all the credit and um, I bet you more often than not, they'll jump at it. And there'll be people idea. who will refuse it because they have other commitments, et cetera. But that's what's called networking, quite literally. And that's the people who would love to build up their media or filming whatever resume, et cetera. And they will be thrilled to do something like that. And it's that's also your outreach yeah. as you do that. Absolutely, there's like Ryerson, there's Seneca, there's lots of places, George Brown, and just get in touch with these people and find some students that are looking to build up their showreel, absolutely.